Um, I have made the comment, and I made an announcement at the previous two services, and I'm going to make it again because this is exciting time for us. Make the comment into our church for the last week and a half, just going through thinking and kind of about uh, just, you know, especially with the topic that we're dissecting. Um, we actually have nine pregnancies going on right now in this church. Nine. And some of you look like you're responsible for some of those pregnancies. <laughs> right now, I can see the face. But um, it's exciting, it's exciting. Um, I'm a little concerned because the nursery is not that big. Uh, it is getting crowded and crowded. And that's a, that's a definitely a good problem to have when it comes to space. And uh, our church is growing, definitely growing. Like if you're visiting, I don't want you to get confused. People don't come and get pregnant in this church. You have to be pregnant to join the church. I just want you to know that we're a very fruitful and friendly church. As we are. So people love each other in the context of marriage, have gifts, and it's just exciting times for us. But um, I am reminded of our conversation today because as a father of three, married for 17 years now to my beautiful wife, I have discovered that the words of uh, Stephen, which is the first guy that will eventually die after preaching. So I've got to be careful when I preach because this guy gets killed as he ends up the conversation in the book of Acts. If you have a Bible, I'd like for you to pull it out. <coughs> Acts chapter 7, Stephen is conveying this message that he goes back into Old Testament history, back at the beginning of the conversation that we covered last week, actually, as we launched into the Exodus series. And he begins with Abraham, just giving an oration on how God started this whole <laughs> movement and how he selected specific men and women. When he gets to that timeline and he stops at Moses, it is verse 20 basically where he says, at, the t at that time in history, Moses was born. Now, the that time is what I conveyed to you last week on chapter 1. Because in chapter 1, on Exodus, is the time where the Bible says that now that the Hebrews have come into Egypt and they have multiplied, Pharaoh is frightened. And he starts putting, you know, oppression on them by making them slaves. He sends the midwives to basically say, if it's a boy, kill the boy. If it's a girl, let it go. As they are bringing more Hebrews into the picture. And then in his frustration, we ended up last week saying that he basically makes this whole um, social media through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram says, any baby that is born that is a boy, put him into the Nile River. So, Stephen is, again, going through the narration. And he comes to this place where he says, Moses was born in this context. It's chapter 2 of Hebrews where he actually is born. So we covered chapter 1 last week, and today we're going to chapter 3 because chapter 2 is his birth. And when he's born, Stephen says he was no ordinary child. So we have nine kids coming this way within the next few months. Beautiful children. We pray for those pregnancies. We pray for the grace of God and just to carry ladies. And I pray specifically for those who are married to pregnant women. Oh, many stuff. <laughs> Anyways, but um, and I just got to say so, uh, I believe that none of those nine kids on their way to show up in this church are ordinary. I think every single child, would you agree with that? I mean, you look at your kids. Can you tell, well, my first one, man, he's, he's something else. The other one, they're just average. Uh -huh. You want to say that, would you? I hope not. But the, the point of it is that, you know, Stephen makes this, this again, just, just amazing statement that Moses was no ordinary child. Now, here's what I want to think about for a second, because the Christmas season is a season where a lot of people, they feel ordinary. Christmas season is funny sometimes, because this is the time where a lot of these memories come into place. Needless to say, this is the month of the year where we're coming to the end of the year. <coughs> so 2014 is pretty much in the books. And yet, we were facing the certainty of beginning a brand new Phase, a brand new experience with 2015, chronologically speaking. Now, why would Stephen say something like this? Because I look at the Bible and I, I listen to the words of Stephen, which again is going to be killed within the next few verses. And I'm thinking to myself, did, did he get killed because he missed the Bible? 
Did he get killed because he miscommunicated? See, because in my mind, watch this. In my mind, I, I, it's hard for me to see Moses as an extraordinary child. When if you think about it, by chapter 2 of the book of Exodus, I gave you chapter 1 last week, which by the way, on your handouts, bottom of the page, you can watch those sermons online. But chapter 1 of last week, we ended up by Pharaoh saying, kill every single boy. By chapter 2, this happened. So think about it. If you're Moses, if you are Moses, and you eventually become the prince of Egypt, you're not the prince of Egypt yet, but as you are growing up, you are the remembrance of a massacre. Yourself in the community, when men and women saw you, you reminded them that my son should be alive. And if my boy would have made it, instead of being at the bottom of the Nile, it would be your age. So, so think about it. How do you call a man extraordinary when all that he knows is to live life in the shadow of tragedy? I don't know about you, but to see the death of that many babies in one single shot because of a man who was insecure and fearful, but him of Pharaoh. So, so you know the story. He, he grows to be the prince of Egypt, and, 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 and once he gets to that age, around 40, for some reason, his moral compact, his, his moral kind of a guidance kicks in. And Moses develops this sense of being totally against injustice and unfairness. He wants to be right. He wants to be just. He wants to see fairness. And once he goes to this identity crisis that he's not really an Egyptian, but he's not fully blended into Hebrews, to the Hebrew people, he discovers, he sees that a, an Egyptian is abusing a Hebrew. And he jumps into the deal because that's unfair. And he jumps into the deal and he kills the Egyptian, the Bible says. And he buries the body. And he goes on with life. The very next day, this is chapter 2 of Exodus, the Bible says that now he sees two Hebrews fighting among themselves. And because he is driven by fairness, he jumps into the fight and says, why are you punishing your own brother? The guy turns around and says, who made you ruler over us? Or, unless you're thinking about killing me the way that you killed the Egyptian yesterday. See, Moses thought that that was a secret, but he never realized that somebody took a picture, put it on Instagram, so he went home, checked Facebook, and there it is, going after the Egyptian. Evidence, because you and I know, come on, look at me, you and I know that secrecy is a myth. Come on, young people, you gotta listen to this. You gotta listen to this one. Secrecy is a myth. There is no such a thing as secrecy in this life. And the adults, oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> and they've done that. <laughs> All right? So, so think about it. Because of this situation, he is literally run away from Egypt. And his first encounter with people, apparently, as we go into the story, is sitting by this well where there are seven ladies of a uh, priest from Midian. His name is Jethro. And the ladies are watering the flock, watering, you know, sheep and goats. And as they are minding their own business, some shepherds show up and they try to bully the girls, those ladies from Jethro's home. And Moses steps up to the plate once again because he cannot stand justice, injustice. And he runs this man away, which I am in my mind thinking, Moses should have, he had to be like a man's man, like a manly dude. Because I don't know why these shepherds would run away from Moses. I have no idea. I don't know if he looked like Dwayne Johnson. I don't know. I, you know, I don't know. I mean, if the guy is symbolic. No one stood up to Moses, and they run away. So the girls go back home. Jethro looks at them and says, "Hey, how come you guys are early?" Well, because this time there was an Egyptian who saved us. And Jethro says, "Bring me that Egyptian." You know the story. Moses shows up. He ends up marrying one of the girls, and he finds a home in a place, in a family, in a foreign land. It is there where we picked up the conversation this morning, as you pull out your handouts. Because now Moses, watch this please, watch this. Moses now is in charge. Now he is 
80 years old. He was 40 when he met Egypt. Now we push fast forward, and we go into the A mark, and this is what the guy is doing. Moses, chapter 3, verse 1, was tending the flock of Jethro. Woo! Excited, yeah? The shepherd. Come on. It wasn't even his own business. He was working for his father-in-law. So, so think about it. If you get to watch the movie, it just came out Friday, Exodus. I mean, the guy was literally in charge of the world. He was the prince of Egypt. And he goes from majesty. He goes from, from wealth and prestige and fame and just power. He goes into the experience where now he has to now walk into the shadow or through the shadow of now his father. The Bible says that he was the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, which is the mountain of God. Look at verse 2. It was there in the middle of the ordinary. See, because I read these verses, and I'm thinking to myself, no wonder Stephen got killed. He missed the point. See, he, he missed the story. He didn't know the Bible. He didn't read scripture very well, because Moses is doing the ordinary. Moses is doing a very common job. Moses is a nobody. Moses is literally a big time, look at me, big time <laughs> loser. That's what Moses is. Because it is in this context that once Moses is in the normal, ordinary, mundane, that the angel of the Lord, see, I wish in the Bible will say this. I wish. Some of you would love this narrative to be ch ch changed. For the, for the Bible says, when Moses was at his apex, at the pinnacle of his spirituality, when he was a giant in the word, when he was... No. No, 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 no. Moses is at the deepest of 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 just ordinary life. And the angel shows up and appears to him and in flames of fire from within him. Goes, Listen. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So here's the principle I want to take home with you today. God reveals His glory through the ordinary with the purpose to create the extraordinary. Now this is very important to us to convey, to think about, because typically we are very consumed. Please please listen. We're so consumed by the supernatural, by the extraordinary, that we forsake that God uses common circumstances to reveal Himself. How do I know this? See, what you do not find in the Bible is Moses seeing this burning boot, and he goes in and finds a way to dig that plant or that tree, takes the plant and goes home and says, this is a special plant. <laughs> ah, what made the plant special? There was a fire that did not consume the plant because the point is not the plant. The point is the fire. The point is the presence of God. See, we just sang about the glorious night, which implies why was the night glorious? Because the Messiah was born. That is the reason. In other words, there is nothing magical in this building unless God dwells in here. Are you following me on this? See, this is why when I walk into the movie theater on Friday, to watch the movie, Exodus, because I had to watch the movie, right? I just had to watch the movie. I couldn't help it. I had to watch the movie. I just felt the Lord leading me towards it. I'm sorry. I'm watching the movie. And one of the things that I was a little afraid as I walked into the movie theater, it was I was like, dude, I have so high, such high expectations, not necessarily for biblical content, because I know that Hollywood how to deviate the whole thing. You know, that's fine. I was just very eager to see the effects of the plays. Mercy. They did not disappoint. You gotta watch what that did. It's just, it's just creativity at its best. But here's the point. Why I'm bringing the plagues into, into, into this conversation? Because when you look at the scriptures, see the plagues, the supernatural aspect of the plagues are not the plagues. I want you to hear this one. See, Egyptians were able to do the same things, or at least they were able to worship the same things. Do you know what the point of the plagues is? It's the intensity and the timing of the plagues. Which implies, you Egyptians worship the Nile. I control the Nile. You worship cattle. I birth the cattle. And you go on through the list of how these Egyptians, they literally represent something that has to do with the deities and their spirituality 
And God shows up and says, I control what you worship. So if you translate this principle into the book of Joshua, and Joshua moving into Jericho, trying to conquer this fortified city, this amazing city, powerful city, and he walks around the city, as you know the story, walks around the city, and on that final day, he walks around the city seven times, and on that seven turn around, he blows the trumpet and the walls come down. Now, I want to hear this. People will say, well, that was just an earthquake. And I will say, okay, I want to give you the benefit of the doubt. The, the doubt. More than likely, it was an earthquake. But you know what the issue with the earthquake is? The timing and the intensity. So I don't know if you're hearing me say this clearly this morning. Ordinary things are the background, are the backdrop of extraordinary. Some of you are going through this 2000, 2014, and you're moving into 2015, and you have not failed. Some of you are married to people who remind 